I just want to forewarn you, there are like two, maybe three typos. Um, I had my youngest sister type. I blame it all on her. <laughs> Should I have proofread? Yes. Did I? No. <laughs> Story of my life. <laughs> um, so my name is Pony White. Um, the presentation I'm going to share with you guys today is called Knowledge is Power, the American Dream Bias. Um, so just backtracking before I get into the agenda. So like, when I was asked to give this presentation, um, which was like over a month ago, maybe two months ago, um, I was like, okay, cool. Like, that's cool. I've never done a workshop before, but like, I'm super excited and geeked. Um, but then I was like, I have absolutely no idea really what to like focus it on. Because when we're talking about like bias, I'm like, okay, that's up my alley. Like, I don't bias. Like, I experienced that. Like, let's go. Um, but then I realized like, yeah, but like, which bias do I want to talk about? You know, <laughs> like, there's so much here to choose from. Um, so about a week ago, yeah, like I knew about this a month ago. <laughs> I got started a week ago, the college struggle. Um, about a week ago, it finally hit me that I wanted to talk about, you know, the bias around um, like immigrants in academia, um, being an immigrant in that was in academia. So the agenda, which is kind of backwards, my intro, my agenda, but whatever. Um, my agenda is the intro to your moderator, the American dream, exploring biases and inequities. Where do we go from here? Moderate a question and then discussion. So that's me in the same shirt. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> my name is Pony White. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a West African immigrant. Um, my family, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but uh, yeah. So my topic is the American dream. Um, and just kind of like dissecting like, what does that mean, right? So like, when I was thinking about bias, I was thinking like, oftentimes like a big bias is like this whole concept of the American dream, especially for like immigrants like myself. It's like, oh, like, you know, you have all these different accomplishments and you've done all these things and like you're achieving the American dream. But like, what does that truly mean? And like, what are the barriers that are up, you know, when we are talking about this? So diving into that, I wanted to first talk about my accomplishments, you know, like the first, you know, immigrant that we go and talk about is me. Um, so like I shared before, I'm a first generation college student. So first generation pretty much means I am the first in my generation to graduate from college. Thank you for that clap. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, so pretty much my parents did not graduate college. My mom didn't even graduate high school. Um, and so I was kind of the first to do it. Um, I earned a bachelor's in multimedia journalism and political science from Minnesota State University, Moorhead. Um, I'm an organizer. I started my work in advocacy around repro justice, gender justice, early education um, justice, and with a racial justice framework. And now I'm currently in early education policy consulting. So the numbers, another positive, over 28% of college students in the US are immigrants. Woof, woof. You know, I'm in that percentile. Um, black women are one of the most educated Democrats, oh, de de demographics. Oh. <laughs> black women are one of the most educated demographics in America. I love that I also fit into that uh, demographic as well. And so my big question, my million dollar question that we'll come back to towards the end is, with those things that I just shared, being first gen, being graduated, being a professional, are we our ancestors' wildest dreams? Because like, we hear that a lot, right? We hear like, oh my goodness, I'm my ancestors' wildest dream. Like, I just got this dream job. I'm my ancestors' wildest dream. I graduated college. I'm my ancestors' wildest dreams. Are we our ancestors' wildest dreams? So I'll come back to that. So how did I get here? Navigating imperialism, systemic violence, war, racism, and white supremacy before adulthood. Because previously, I just talked about all of the wonders, all of you know the pros, the things that you kind of hear about immigrants, right? Sometimes, especially in like higher education, like it's oh, like we have these statistics of you know we have high college graduate rates. Um, we even when I was in college, I used to look at the the international students and be like, oh, so you rich, rich, huh? Because ain't no way America's expensive. Ain't no way, my boy. So like we have all these different you know thoughts about you know the immigrant experience and we root it all around their success. We root it all around like oh look at you go like you've done all these wonderful things, and we don't talk enough about the barriers. And oftentimes when we do that, we also have this pull yourself up by the bootstrap mentality. Someone like myself who was able to graduate um, high school and college and is in a career 
they sometimes turn around and say, well, if I could do it with all of the barriers that I had, well, you should be able to do it too. And we don't talk about the inequities and we don't talk about, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, various barriers that we don't even have. You know, we don't talk about our privileges. And so I kind of wanted to pull it back. I wanted to start off by talking about my successes, pat myself on the back, but let's, let's roll it back. How did I get here? So like I shared, <clears throat> I'm a West African immigrant. I am from Liberia. So Liberia is pretty small. <laughs> We're right here. Um, so this is where I'm from. I was born in Ghana, so I was born in Accra. So just like take a little scale over there. <laughs> but my family for the most part is Liberian. So my family, oh, let me not hurt myself. <laughs> my family, um, my mom specifically, it was an immigrant, was a refugee. So throughout her entire duration, Liberia of her life, Liberia was in the civil war. So Liberia has been in about like a 13 year civil war. So my mom had me when she was about like 16. So my mom's like 39 right now. So not that old. So that's, that's a big chunk of her life, you know, growing up in Liberia. My mom has about full, five bullet wounds to show for experiencing war. Um, her family was displaced many times, um, experienced harsh um, poverty. Um, because of that, my mom was not able to access an ed a full education. Um, she has about a ninth grade level education. And then about a year after me being born, we came to the US. So a 17 year old, very young, new to a country, doesn't fully understand the system, doesn't fully grasp the language either, um, and has to survive and has to ensure that her child survives. Um, so that's a little bit of my background. Um, and so I'm the oldest sister of three, and talking about that too, um, if you know anything about ethnic families and specifically West Africans, you know that to be the oldest daughter is to pretty much not exist as your own person. You are a character in everyone else's lives, especially your parents. And so there's a lot on your shoulders. You have to be great. You have to be successful. You have to, you know, be like a second mom. You have to be a therapist. You have to be all of these different things. Um, sometimes you don't get full acknowledgement, but that's just what it is. And also my family is working class, um, kind of like I shared before, um, just like with you know my mom's situation my family is working class oh one thing i forgot that let me backtrack because i love talking about this one i grew up predominantly in rural minnesota i love to say that i am kind of a naturalized minnesotan because i came to minnesota when i was about five years old so my mom met like met my dad who my, my stepdad who lives who was living in minnesota at the time and so we moved to minnesota when i was about five years old and at the time i lived in the twin cities like the metro area and so I was around people who looked like me, who sounded like me, a culture that I understood. Um, and at one point, especially during that period, um, Minnesota was like one of, you know, had the, one of the biggest populations of Liberians in the country. We rival with Philadelphia and Atlanta. Um, so it was, it was home. I saw people that were like me. And then over time, my parents were like, yeah, we're just gonna take you out of your safe little environment. Um, and, and they moved me to rural Minnesota. I grew up in East Grand Forks, Minnesota. Do you guys know where I'm at? Uh, why is it going in that? You know where that was at? Like, <laughs> I love to rep my set. I really do. I, I drag them a lot, but I love to rep my set. Um, but yeah, and so I grew up in um, East Grand Forks, Minnesota. And yeah, that's a little bit of my background as an immigrant. So exploring biases and inequities. Immigrants are not a monolith, right? So back to like what I was saying in the beginning, oftentimes like a huge bi uh, bias that we have is that immigrants in higher ed are monolithic. So like all immigrants, even the ones who experience similar, like, you know, um, systemic inequities have the same experiences. Meaning like, oh, if we're talking higher ed and you see like, you know, uh, uh, certain um, populations are uh, succeeding and, you know, graduating and going on to careers, it's this idea that like all immigrants are, you know, successful or like they're good at this, like if, if they're in this higher ed space. And that puts the burden of not fully understanding like, what the inequities are and how we're navigating this. So with this, immigrants are not a monolith. It actually recently came to me when I was talking to um, my boyfriend's dad. So my boyfriend is Nigerian. Uh, anybody, <laughs> any, anybody that knows, anybody that knows West Africans know we forever got beef with each other, but it's all love. Um, but my boyfriend's Nigerian. And I jokingly, I'm like, I'm like, you're like a middle upper class, like West African, like you, you know, your family comes with blah, blah, blah. And we like joke about it sometimes. But um, his dad was like talking to me and his dad said, you know, I think you should apply for like one of the Ivies. Like you should, you should go ahead and try to apply for like Harvard. You should apply for this. And I was like, oh, I don't know, you know, whatever. Like, you know, listen to it, took it and appreciated it. 
But then I sat and I thought, and I was like, never in my life did my parents ever say you should apply to Harvard. They never said that to me. And it's not that they didn't think I'm brilliant. And it's not that my parents don't want me to do all the wonderful things in this world. My parents, especially my mom, is like my biggest cheerleader. But my parents didn't have the same access to that knowledge and understanding that his um, parents did. So like my parents can acknowledge that like we want our child to be successful. But as far as we're talking about a Western system that we've never had access to, we've never navigated, what does that success look like? What does that mean? I couldn't tell you step by step by step, like what exactly I think my daughter should do or go. I just know like, I want my daughter to be successful. So we aren't having those conversations. Whereas like, we're talking about another, you know, another country that has like currently right now, Nigeria is one of the richest countries in um, Africa. Liberia is one of the poorest countries in the entire world. <laughs> like, we're not like, when I was looking up my stats for this, like Nigeria and Liberia stats were not even in the same page because they're like top 10 richest countries. And they're like, and I'm like, I'm like, so where's Liberia? And they're like, no, you're not on this page. We don't even, we're not censoring them. Like, please get off our website. Um, so I had to like track down this information on separate pages because we're talking about separate experiences. And for me, it was really interesting because I think we know this a lot and we talk about this a lot in like policy or in just in academia and analyzing things. We center it around like our um, Asian um, American um, Pacific Island population. We center it around them. We say, oh, we know like some of our Asian immigrants come from, you know, countries and families that are more wealthy and have a better um, economic mobility. And then some don't. So therefore, like when we're talking about like how we need to serve them, who we need to help, we can't just lump them all into one group because we're talking about different issues. Um, and I never realized that for like myself being like African or West African, because I always think like, oh, we're like, we're one people. Like we have similar cultures. Like we love the same things. Like it never dawned on me until that conversation with like my boyfriend's dad, who, you know, is literally a dean of a college. Like his mom is a psychiatrist. Like his, his parents, you know, they, they went to college. They did all of that. Like they put all their kids through college. It was a thing that it was a part of, you know, their household. It was a part of their lives and, and it, there was an understanding of it. My family, my mom didn't even have access to, you know, like formal, like high school, formal education. So she couldn't, she wasn't able to have that type of conversation with me. So that's kind of like about when we talk about immigrants are not a monolith. A bias in and of itself is the belief that immigrants in higher ed are monolithic. Not even immigrants who are all POC are exposed to racism, um, have the same experiences of inequities. So things to consider. Recently arrived immigrants hold an even higher completion rate of a bachelor's degree or higher at nearly 50%. This data suggests that immigrant students are more successful when they come to the US for a higher education, like a bachelor's degree or higher in college, and less successful when they begin their education in the US in grade school or high school. This, this could be attributed to having more access to resources on campus and being able to adapt to US schools more easily at an older age. So again, talking about how we're not monolithic, this is a perfect example of your first gens and your international students, which sometimes we conflate. Our stats conflate it. When they talk about the success of immigrants in higher ed, they are mixing in our international students. They're mixing in our students who had, you know, the economic ability to come to the U.S. to study, who, you know, have the family support to, to be in these type of spaces. And that's not always the same when it comes to our um, immigrant populations that were born and raised here like me. A lot of the immigrant populations that were born and raised in the US do experience high poverty rates. And so that's like a, like a big thing that needs to be you know, taken account of when we're, when we're looking at inequities and we're talking about bias, because if we don't center that, then we kind of frame ourselves, we frame our talking points just around those who are doing well. So being from the same continent does not ensure the same experiences. To my point earlier, Nigeria is currently ranked as one of the richest African countries and a country that is on a global economic rise. Liberia is one of the poorest and least developed countries in the world. And I just want to say that just because I'm like, you know, stating this and saying like, these are the big differences between these two different, you know, cultures, doesn't mean that it doesn't also apply to the people in the country as well. Because there's definitely areas, like we can look at, like India is a great example. Like, India has um, uh, uh, areas where it's highly populated by like extremely wealthy people, people who have means and access and ability. And then we can you know, travel a few miles away and see that there's people there experiencing high levels of poverty. 
But that's also a great, this is a great example too about talking about like not thinking of people as monoliths, not thinking of, of immigrants as monoliths. Because when we do that, then we say things like, oh, well, you're from this country that's super successful. So that means you should be successful or your family should be wealthy enough or you should be able to like uh, make it here and, you know, not have these types of barriers. Like, what do you mean? Why aren't you doing it? Pull yourself up by the bootstrap. So how can we challenge biases and systemic inequities when one, we think, when we one, think all immigrant experiences are the same and two, don't center those most at risk. So again, for this, um, for this presentation, I kind of racked my brain because I'm like, okay, who do I want to center? Like, who do I want to talk about as far as like immigrants? Because that's a big thing. Like I could talk about immigrant women. I could talk about, you know, black immigrant women. And I usually generally tend to focus my lens because I'm a black woman um, through racial um, justice um, and black experiences. But I kind of racked my brain and I kind of came to this, you know, conclusion that I was like, I think I want to center the immigrants experiencing a lot of bias. And the reason I want to do this is because when we talk, when we talk about when we center, when we talk in policy spaces about like how we should tackle, you know, policy issues, we always said we should center the people experiencing the most harm, because if we center the people at the bottom experiencing the most harm, that trickles up. A lot of times people think it's the other way around that if we center the folks at the top, it'll trickle down, but it doesn't. It hasn't. It won't. <laughs> so that's a little crash course. So it's a, it's a really big thing where whenever we're framing or we're talking about like policies or like, oh, how are we going to support these communities? There has to be several people in the room saying like, if you say something like, we should give all students laptops, someone has to say, do they have Wi-Fi at home? Because if we give all students Wi-Fi uh, laptops, we're starting from the middle class. We say, we, we are assuming that everybody has Wi-Fi at home, but we give everyone laptops. The students who don't have Wi-Fi at home now cannot access it. So they're still struggling. They're still left behind. But if we started from them and said, okay, you don't have Wi-Fi, you don't have a, a, a place to really, you know, uh, study and work, um, you don't have a laptop, we're going to ensure that all of our students have all of these things. The kids that already have that are fine. They're not like, oh my goodness, you're trying to make sure I have Wi-Fi and I already have it, shucks. Like, they're not losing anything. They're not losing out on anything. But we're ensuring that others who don't have that are centered. So I decided for this that I would try to center immigrants uh, experiencing the most bias. And I also wanted to just throw it to the group if there, if you think there's any demographics I'm missing, there is a demographic I'm missing. And I just want to see if people are, you're up on it. You're thinking about bias and inequities in this world. Ooh, I feel like there's some educators in here and I'm calling y'all out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say a demographic that I am missing is um, immigrants with disabilities. So we have first generation, we have women and gender non-conforming people, we have Muslim immigrants, we have non-English as first language speakers, we have queer immigrants, we have black and non-white passing immigrants, and then we have our working class immigrants. So immigrants experiencing low income um, economic um, issues. So my number one bias that I wanna talk about today is access, lack of access. So a fast fact, about 4.2 million students in the US may be considered first generation low-income college students. Only 9% of them will earn a bachelor's degree by age 24, compared to 77% from high-income families. I just want to say I'm a part of that 9%. What's up? <laughs> but that's, that's the reality, right? And that's due to a lack of access. So I'm going to get into that more. So lack of access looks like financial support. So whether applying for loans, scholarships, or just affording college, many low-income first-gen students can't afford college and lack the resources and support. The next one is lack of access, understanding college documents. So college documents are inaccessible. Non-English as a first language speakers struggle accessing documents in their native language. This is especially true for folks whose language is not European. So that's our Spanish, our French, our English, um, our Portuguese, you know, the long list. And then internet and technology. Amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, many K through 12 schools realized the need of supplying students with laptops iPads, and briefly, some were able to offer students broadband services as well. It was really interesting. I threw that in there kind of as an example because it was interesting that during the um, pandemic is when a lot of schools were like, wait a second, like things are not equitable. Like we have students who can't turn in assignments because what? They say they don't have laptops at home? What? They say they don't have Wi-Fi? What? They say they don't have a place to do homework? What do you mean? And I'm like, it's crazy because that's always been persistent. That's always been a thing. But it seemed like we only cared about it when it went, when it impacted everyone, right? When it became a thing that impacted those who are important. 
And so sometimes we ask the question like, who matters, who doesn't? And when we're talking about policies and we're talking about these issues, like who are we saying like, oh, we're okay with them struggling. We're okay with them not being able to turn in their homework. We're okay with them, you know, just not um, being able to do what, you know, they need to do to be present in the classroom. We're fine with that. But there's students that we're not okay with. And so I have a story about that actually. So during my, um, I literally never talk about this because it's like, and it's like being recorded high. <laughs> but um, during my uh, junior year of high school, so I was about 17 years old, I took this online psychology class. Now, if you know me, you know, I'm like an overachiever. I'm a perfectionist. I like always want to do good. I, I'm not a kid. And I'm always doing too many things at once. But I took this online psychology course and I like fucked it. I didn't pass it. And the reason I didn't pass this class, which I don't talk about ever in my life, <laughs> but here we are today, y'all my people, keep it between us, um, is because I didn't have like a laptop that was accessible at home. Like the laptop that we, my family had was I think about like, I don't know, like 80, 100 bucks. Like it was this very basic like laptop um, that my dad watched like ESPN clips on. <laughs> But all it had was like this notepad. And I remember constantly going back and forth with this like um, professor who was like virtual. And she'd be like, you need to turn it in. And at this time, I didn't even know what these words meant. She's like, you need to turn it in as a Microsoft Word. Like you have to download it, then like change it into a PDF and then send it into me. And I'm like, oh, no, like it's here. Like it's in the notes. I sent it. Like I can't, like my computer can't do that. I don't have Microsoft. I don't have Excel. I don't have the things you're talking about. I can't do that. Like, and it's like a back and forth. Like I'd send it. She's like, no, this is not what I want. I told you not to send it this way. And I'm just like, oh my goodness. And then she'd be like, you know, it's past the due date. Like I'm not taking it. Like it was just this constant back and forth. And I didn't have any form of support. I wasn't going to, you know, a school that was supporting me. And to backtrack into when I talked about, you know, going to school in uh, rural Minnesota, one thing about rural cities, especially in Minnesota, they do kind of lack support, like by our policies, by our politicians they don't get the funding that they deserve and need. They don't get that, you know, equitable, so, uh, equitable support to actually support students. And so when you're a small rural town that's fighting policy, politicians for, you know, funding to basic things, and now you have to deal with like, you know, your, your students of color who are like 1%, who are like, oh, you know, my parents can't help me, you know, because they're not home when I get home. Like, oh, there's a language barrier, there's this. They're not bringing that to the table. Cause they look at you as like, we don't have time for this. We, we're begging them to just give us a little bit. We don't have time to now negotiate about your needs. So being a black student in rural Minnesota, I literally got kicked to the side. I didn't have that support. I was able to do PSEO because I had good grades. I tested great. And they're like, yeah, if you want to. And I was like, yeah, I'll do it. Like, I mean, it'll make college cheaper, you know, that's cool. Um, so that's why I did it. But I didn't have any guidance. There was no one that was like, hey, I see that you're struggling. I see that you're lacking. Oh, you might need a computer at home. Oh, hey, maybe you should do your work at the library. Like there was none of that. And so I filled that class. Number two, racial bias, racism slash anti-blackness. Child, you knew it was coming. Hello. <laughs> we ain't gonna talk about bias and not talk about racism. <laughs> so racial or ethnic minority groups make up more than a third of first-gen students. As such, they have to overcome racial disparities and discrimination. Racism influences academic performance. Context of perception, which is a new phrase that I learned while I was doing this, um, putting this presentation together, is a phrase used to help explain how immigrant students perform in US schools based on how they were received by teachers and their fellow classmates. If they are discriminated against, immigrant students tend to perform more poorly in school. On the contrary, if an immigrant student is welcomed and embraced, they feel more comfortable in their learning environment and perform better. Now, two of the things that I talked about previously, so like this, talking about, you know, if students are treated better, they perform better, that could be said across the board. I don't feel like we need stats and studies to tell us that, that like if you ostracize students, if you make them feel small, if you make them feel inferior and excluded, where is the teaching happening? They're not going to be present trying to learn that equation on the board. They're not trying to learn their spelling. They're trying to survive that classroom because they feel hostility. They feel like they're not welcomed here. They don't wanna be here. Why are they here? What's the point of learning if it's not fun, if they don't feel like you even care? And I feel like that's across the board. Same as, I'm just backtracking, some of these lack of access. I mentioned these and something that was interesting when I was putting this together is like, I'm like, this could be said for anybody. Like all my friends across the board could say, yeah, financial support, that's, that's rough. Colleges are awful when it comes to finances. 
you know, college documents being as inaccessible. Who really read any of these contracts that we signed? Did you really like, like raise your hands? Did you even understand the full words? Your 17, 18 year old brain, like reading, like, are you sure you want to apply for this college? You're like, yeah, like whatever. <laughs> like, and internet and technology, like school life has always sucked. <laughs> so like, we know, right? And our, and our parents have to roll out if we have that support, if we have parent support. They got to roll out a lot of money to make sure that we have laptops, to make sure that we have iPads, to make sure that we have all the things that we need to be present in school. So um, the next slide that I had was, there's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. Whenever I talk about racism and like, and center it in any type of you know equity conversation or policy conversation it's because oftentimes times people think that they can exist they can talk about an issue and not talk about race because it's like this you know sub factor but it all rolls into one another even i see that amongst like immigrant populations there are oftentimes like immigrants will be like oh like you know there's the black experience and then there's like my immigrant experience and I'm like, those two things just are not separate for me. Like my experience as a black woman and the inequities I deal with always somehow correlate and get interchanged with my experience as an immigrant because we don't live single issue lives. So number three, economic bias, lack of affordability. So 45% of immigrant families are considered low income. That makes it really, really hard to access higher ed when you're low income. Post-secondary attainment rates of young people who come from low-income households and regardless of income or immigration status, whose parents have no college experience are low across the board. Exacerbating the financial constraints is the reality that low-income students and those whose parents have little education are frequently ill-prepared academically to succeed in college. Number four, interpersonal bias. So lack of support. This one, I kind of always talk about um, because it's, it's, it's very integral to like my experiences. Um, the header is you can't teach what you don't know. So again, back to like what I was saying about my experience, um, having a mother who um, did not, was not able to have the full education that she wanted. It was really difficult. My high school experience and, and we had, we'd have, you know, I went through highs and lows of, you know, feelings in real time, being a young person, like, why can't you help me? Why don't you know this? Why, you know, like, why am I all alone in this? Um, and now I'm at a point where I can kind of like sit and be like, I, I get it. I get the full picture of things. But when I was growing up, I didn't have help, you know, doing homework. I didn't have help, you know, doing a, putting a project together. But I have West African parents who expected excellence. And if anybody knows anything about ethnic parents, you better get good grades. You're never going to get told, like, get a job. I love that you got an A, but get a B. I dare you. Get, get a B. It's like, so what are you doing with your life? So you want to shame us so you don't care anymore about yourself? Um, so, so that's kind of how it was. It was that energy, but also it was like, my parents are not going to help me with school work. So, like, I'm over here, like, I'm so frustrated. I'm like, how dare you? Like, I'll show you with math. Did you help me with math? But you want me to get an A? Like, what do you mean? So that's, that's kind of what it is. You can't fully teach what you don't know. And the reason why sometimes our families can't come into that space is not that they don't want to. And I went through that a lot with my mother because my mom is like my biggest cheerleader and she loves me so much, but she couldn't teach what she doesn't know. She didn't have that experience. And no one, when she came to this country, like held her hands. There's also a huge lack of access around communication when it comes to like immigrant families and parents. So she's like this mom that's like, I would love, you know, to be able to support my child, but I literally cannot, I cannot help her apply for college. I can, I don't, I also don't know what FAFSA is. Like, I'm also sitting here like, huh, like, okay, like, what, is, what does that mean? And a lot of it was literally me being like, all right, I'll just, I'll just do it myself, I'll just figure it out. And I remember me and my mom had a lot of tough conversations towards um, my senior year. And even when I got into college where she's like, I just feel like sometimes you think I'm stupid. Like you don't ask me for help. And I just feel like useless as your mom because I'm supposed to be your mom, but I can't help you. And you, and I feel like you know it because you don't ask me for help. And I had to be like, no, like I, I think my mom's one of the most amazing people ever. And I tell this a billion times over, but I'm like, no, I think you're so wonderful and you're so amazing. And you're this great person who's done all these um, wonderful things. And I hate that you're made to feel inferior in this system that didn't help you, that didn't support you. And, you know, again, back to the school system, just not having the support that they need to adequately, you know, be there for parents in that way. 
So I'm, I'm not going to school and teachers are saying, oh, I get it, I see, you know, you're a brilliant student, you clearly have good grades, you clearly test well, things are clearly, you know, you, you clearly have good parents, but your parents just can't support you in that way because they're always working because they're low income and two, they don't understand the system. This is their first round too. Like when I went to college for the first time, it was also my mom's first time dealing with college and learning the new thing. And when I would call frustrated, like, well, they said they, they're not gonna process this because you didn't do this and da, 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 da. And she would just be so heartbroken. And she'd just be like, I'm so sorry. And I, and I really felt that for her because you can't teach what you don't know. So the unfortunate reality is that many first gen students are left behind because to support them academically would require knowledge of a system that many of their families are unfamiliar with. So family pressures. Once immigrant origin students are in school, their dropout rates tend to be higher because many come from poor households. They juggle multiple responsibilities, which makes it more challenging for them to stay in school and complete their degrees on time. Mrs. Batolba said, if there is a health or family emergency, they lack a safety net to fall back on that interferes with attending classes and completing assignments. So that's also extremely true. And I have like two big points on this one that we're gonna sit on for a second. So my second year of my undergrad, so like I said, overachiever, always doing the most in like five billion tech activities during um, high school, I um, was jam packed. I had, you know, I was a part of, I was an RA, I was working at Walmart. I was a full-time student. I was running the campus feminist organization and the black student union. Um, there was one more thing. Oh, I was a part of this organization and I was also doing campaign organizing work. So I was doing like seven things. Yeah, it's, it's real life. It's, it's really hot. This is what the student, uh, teachers, teachers, we be out here in these streets. Um, <laughs> so I was really doing all of those things. And I remember I got in when I said second year, second, third is because your girl got her degree in three years. Oop. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but I was doing all of these different things. And I remember I got a call um, in December and it was my mom crying and she was like, um, you know, like, like your dad got to take my eyes. Like, here's this family conflict that now is shifting everything that's shifting. Like your, you know, how, like how you can show up in classes, how you can do your work, how you feel about yourself, how you feel about your family. Like what pressures is it now putting on you to, to be there for your family? Like emotionally, financially, whatever it is. And you have all of these 5 billion things flying around you, but here you are trying to like support your family in all the ways that you can. And I remember I started like uh, doing really bad. I had this like policy stats class and I had this professor who's like the professor that doesn't like you. Like we all know that professor, like he's really angry. He hates his life. Like you just know it, like he hates y'all. Like, like he loves like, he loves teaching, but he don't like y'all. Like, so like, so it was one of those guys. Um, and I remember I had like missed a class and then didn't turn something in. So I'd scheduled to go to an office, uh, an office hour with him, but I had to like, um, like go like have a meeting call with like one of my dad's like lawyers with everything that was going on. So I was like late to it. So when I showed up, he's like, I don't care. You shouldn't have been late. It is what it is. You're, my time is valuable, X, Y, and Z. And I remember like, this is a guy because I was always a teacher's pet. So I would try to be really nice to like, my teachers, even the ones that hated me. I was like, I like me, please. Um, but this was a guy who was just like, I would never ruffle his feathers. But I remember that day I like snapped at him. I was just like, I was like, well, I'm sorry that I had to go meet with my dad's attorney because he's a nice attention. And I remember storming out, like just so angry, like, oh, and like one of the first teachers that I said anything to. And I remember that later that day I got home and like, I got this, like this whole mass email from like all of my professors. <laughs> They're like, hello. <laughs> like, <laughs> and he had told them, he was like, let me, let me get a reinforcement because I'm not about to deal with this. I hate these kids, but somebody, <laughs> somebody out there needs to talk to her because she's losing it. Um, and so I have all my teachers being like, hi, so like, we know what's going on in your life. And like, we just like, we heard a rumor, like we want to be there for you. Like, what's up? Like, let us know if you want to chat. Like, here's a link just to let you know, you could take time off if you wanted to. Um, and that's when I finally like, you know, was vulnerable enough to talk about what was going on in my life to my teachers. But there were so many times during my um, college experience that I was like, what if I just didn't do college? Like, what if I was just not here? Because how am I supposed to like be there for my family emotionally, mentally, you know, financially? Like I could really help if I like could just get another job. I could really help if I just threw college away. Like, like what's the point of this? That's a lot of like, the stress that a lot of first generation immigrant students deal with, especially coming from collective cultures that are like, we are family, we are one, like we hold each other up. 
when you're in a space where being in, I would say Western culture and being in like an academic setting, there's a lot of independence there. There's a lot like me, myself. And that's, that's how I felt in those moments. And anytime there was a family conflict, I always felt like I'm being so selfish right now. Like, I don't want to leave college because of me, like, because of my success, because of like what I want for myself, but like my family needs me. And thank goodness, and this is a privilege in itself, and I, I love to talk about my privileges. My mother is one of my privileges because she was a mom that was like, no, like, we need you to get that degree. Like, we need you to do better and be better. Like, not for us, but for you. So I can be like, yes, I did that. Like, I'm proud. And my mom always says, because she feels like there's, there wasn't a lot in her life that she got to fully grasp onto with her experience, but she always feels like I was the one thing she did really good. And so she's always like, when I graduate, when I go through life, she's like, yes, I did that thing good. So, <laughs> so sometimes I'm like, I'm like, girl, you know, you're just trying to brag. Like, yeah. Um, but yeah. And then on the other hand, the other thing I want to talk about, about the family pressures and our families just not knowing exactly like how they can fully support us. Immigrant families will say, get good grades, you know, go be this, go be a doctor, go be that. But then they'll also expect that you're gonna come home and take care of your siblings. That was my parents. They were like, I, I wanna do everything under the sun. I wanted to play, I wanna run track. I wanna do volleyball. I wanna be on speech. I, I, I wanted everything. <laughs> like, I wanted to be in the musical. And my parents' number one thing was like, you can do it if you can manage your sisters. Like if you can find a way to still watch your sisters, whatever. And I always found a way. I was like the kid in my town. Everyone knew that I was always moving around with my siblings. Like the parents, like during games, they, like my youngest sister, she's nine when she was born. During games, like the parents would like hold her, they pass her around. When my mom would even come, because my parents would always work. So like when my mom would come to like a few games, they'd be like, oh, you're this person's mom. Oh my goodness, we love her. We love your baby. And like, and even when my sister would reach out to these people, my mom's like, why is my child reaching out to a stranger? <laughs> <laughs> like, why is she running to that man? We don't know that to come here. And he's like, no, I hold her all the time. <laughs> so that was, that was my experience of like, I wanted what I wanted. And I also like managed to juggle two jobs in high school. I was working at Subway in Old Navy. Um, back to what I said, I, I'm always doing five billion things. Next year, I promise I'm going to do two billion. <laughs> like, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so like that was really it. And it's those two things don't correlate, right? Like when we talk about like, you're saying you want your child to be successful, you want them to have straight A's, but then you're also like, oh, you better come home and clean up. You better do this. You better stay up. Like, oh, you need to wake up and you stop doing homework and come fix this or come take care of your siblings or go to work. Like you're requiring two things that just don't correlate. And the reason why is because they don't, they don't fully understand the system. Like I said, they don't have access to the system, so they don't fully understand it. An example of that that I experienced at my job, um, which is um, in childcare policy consulting work. We were recently in Charlotte um, and we were, we were interviewing families for a uh, deliverable that we're putting together. And one of the moms, the question that we have for her is like, what do you want for your child? And she's like, I want my child to be successful. And these are, these are early, like parents of ch children, like early education. And she's like, I want my child to be successful. And we're like, what does that look like? Because like, you know, we want detail it, let's write it. And she has this long pause and she says it again, I want my child to be successful. And she also has a language barrier. She's like, I want my child to be successful. And we're like, yeah, um, so we restate it in a different way. Like, so like, what, like, what that take? What that look like? Pause, she starts crying. And I'm like, I saw her, I felt her. I knew exactly why she was crying. And so like, everyone's like, oh my God, oh my God. I'm like, I'm like, I'm so sorry. And I was like, one-on-one -on -one with her. I'm like, I'm like, to the interpreter, I'm like, tell her, I think she's an amazing mom. She's amazing. She loves her kid. She's doing every single thing. She cannot tell us what success looks like because all she knows, right, from the outside looking in, I want my child to be successful. And I see the top is you graduate, you go, you go to a good school or you, you, you get a good degree and you make money. I've never been allowed in the room. I've never been allowed in the room to see that, oh, you have to spend X amount of time studying. You have to take these courses. You have to AP, PSEO. You, you have to uh, uh, network. You have to write essays. You have to you know, do all of these different things. I've never been in the room to see that. I don't know what that means. I, if, even if I said those words, it would go over your head. You'd be like, what, what are you talking about? Like, you're, they're not allowed in the room. So they don't even know. They just know like the bare minimum, I want my child to be happy and successful in this system that is so foreign to me, that doesn't make any sense. But at the same time, 
like one thing that I always like to say, our families know exactly what they need and they know exactly what's wrong. So when she started crying, it's because it's almost like the same thing as my mom. Where it's like, my mom knows and can tell people like, I want my child to be successful. But my mom also knows that she doesn't know what that entails, like what that entails. And that hurts her, that breaks her heart because she doesn't know if it's gonna be, wow, my kids stayed up like for four days straight in college and she's so angry and she's so sad and she, you know, and sometimes when I have those weeks where I'm like so stressed with work, my mom's just like, honey. And it's so sad because like, this is the thing that you wanted. This was like what success was supposed to be like. And this puts me now in a privileged place where I'm in a different economic standing than my family, than my mother has ever been in. But also it, it kind of creates this barrier where there's this like, how do we now understand each other? How do we pull each other into spaces when we get there? Rather than saying, pull yourself up. I did it so you can't. And not acknowledging all of these privileges. I, I tell my mom, you're my number one privilege because if not for that woman, that girl who was 16 and experienced all those things, I couldn't be me at all ever. And so that's, that's the real family pressures. So number five, systemic bias, which is like the biggest, the biggest bias, like the system just holds us down forever. It persists. So this is in anti-immigrant policies. So anti-immigrant policies affect first-gen BIPOC students disproportionately. So those look like, you know, ICE deportation. So like literally putting together ICE. Um, <laughs> undocumented, <laughs> undocumented students, lack of full access to aid, or just undocumented students being at risk of being deported or you know, removed from schools um, and losing you know, scholarships and funds. And then an example that I love to use, because again, it goes back to what I said earlier, like who is disposable? Who do we care about who we don't? When, like it was like 2020 summer, I think it was like July, when Trump went ahead and released that executive order where it was like all um, international students coming from X countries like could not come back to the country. Like, when school comes back into session, you cannot come to the country, blah, blah, blah. And you saw all these huge universities, Harvard's over here freaking out, like, we will sue the US government. Like, everyone's like panicking, like, what do you mean? Like, our students can't come back. Like, they're the backbone. They pay for the lights in the school. Because that's really, like, that's really what it was. That's really what it was. So all of these big schools got together across the globe. They all had, you know, they released statements. My school sent an email, like, we stand with our international students and our immigrant students. Oh, yeah. We heard it. Like, they all sent those out. And quickly, the Trump administration was like, we ruled not that. And we don't, it was a joke. Ah, ah, like, and, so, and why I bring that up is because that was an example that for years now, right, we have seen, like, anti-immigrant policies that harm our students. And these schools never thought to collectively get together and show that level of power and demand that you cannot do that to our students. And whether they want to admit it or not, it boils down to who matters and who doesn't. We're talking about Harvard's international students, big spenders. Like you're talking about a lot of money. So we're saying, oh, so you're trying to, you're trying to take our income away from us essentially. That's really it. If we boil, if we come down to the basis because when all of these different policies are happening over the years, we didn't see this level of action. We didn't see this, you know, across the board, we stand in solidarity with our immigrant students and not just saying it, not just sending out a little memo, but being like, yo, we will take actions against the US government if our students do not come back to school in August. So who matters, who doesn't? Whose education doesn't matter? Our first gen immigrant students that are low income, who maybe they got here from a scholarship, they're just getting by, they have all these other things, they have to support their families and eh, whatever, if they're not here, who cares? But if our students who, have you know the economic uh, 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 mobility and the money to, to be in these spaces and they have the connections and networks and their parents are diplomats how dare you but why so this is a quick fact sheet um that i just thought was really cool so like i try to look at it um so it shows like all students in higher education um who are right now first generation immigrant students um whoop, whoop, i was a part of that i'm not currently in <laughs> we'll get back. Grad school, I'm thinking about. <laughs> so that's like about a million. Um, and then our undocumented students, about 42, oh, 427,000. Um, and then our second generation immigrant students is uh, 3 million. And then our international students is 914. Um, so just seeing that breakout was like so, like, I don't know, for me, it was, it was, it was really amazing because 
I, you know, I, I know so much about the experience, like, you know, being an immigrant, I know about, you know, DACA, I know about undocumented students, I know about, you know, different policies that impact um, immigrant um, families and communities. But to see that number, I was like, wow, there's a lot of us, like, despite everything, despite all of the barriers, and even bigger barriers than I experience, like, we're still here, we're still persistent. So, the numbers, to my point of us persisting, nearly 33% of immigrant students attain a bachelor's degree or higher. Whoop, whoop. Hey. Um, and that's including, you know, like I said, that's including our international students. So that number is not a complete shakedown of what I've been talking about, but still pretty cool. And yeah, and still we rise. Despite the biases, inequities, and other barriers to success, we're still doing the damn thing. And I know oh, that's right. Um, so where do we go from here? So I made just a short list of ways that you can um, support um, immigrant, um, um, well, push back on immigrant bias and support immigrant students. So educating ourselves, even as immigrants, I think it's super important because when, when my dad was detained by ICE, like, my family was very, I was deep in policy, so I always had this like weird phobia where I'm like, something bad's gonna happen to us. And my family's like, yo, chill, like, if, just go do that policy stuff over there. Like, we good, like, we're, nothing's gonna happen. I'm like, I feel like something's gonna happen. And so when something happened, I was just like, told y'all, told y'all. Uh, so, so it's important to just educate yourselves, um, know about the communities, different immigrant communities, especially like BIPOC, um, Black immigrant communities. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize that Black immigrants um, face a lot of harm. Um, and there's a lot of policies that are literally put together to kind of like push them out as well. Um, so support student organizations and organizations within our communities that prioritize ensuring all immigrants have access and equitable support in academia. And so that's also with your pockets too. Like, yes, get to know about these organizations. Yes, show up to their different events, um, support when, when they're doing, you know, like write a letter, do this. But also like these organizations exist off dollars because we exist in capitalism. So open your pockets. Um, assist, offer guidance, assisting immigrants, especially first generation immigrants with navigating various systems. I would have loved, I always think of this, and that's why it was so big to me um, to kind of be a support system for other young people because I would have loved to have somebody be like, I know that you don't have a computer at home. I know that your parents work every day. Like, I know you need the support that your school's not able to give you. And how can I help you? Or even in college. Like you might not know, but your parents might know. Your parents might be whizzes at FAFSA. And you, that's, it might be something you brag about because we all are like, FAFSA sucks. And there's always that one kid that's like, my dad does it for me. Like if your dad's doing it for you, call your dad up. Like, hey, like buddy, what's number three A? Like, what does that mean? Like, so like have those type of sessions. Um, advocate, advocate for that. See, that's the type of my sister did. Advocate for policies that support immigrant rights. Advocate against policies that harm or bring more barriers to immigrant access. So, like I said, my million dollar question in the beginning is, so are we our ancestors for all the streams? Now I know some of y'all, because I said this, I said that to one of the organizers, I was like, it's gonna be so funny when I'm in a room full of people who are not the demographic I'm talking about. And I ask, so are we our ancestors for all the streams? And you're just like, uh, um, so, but, but overall, just from everything that I shared, I shared, you know, the good, the cool things, the accomplishments, the reasons people say, I'm my ancestors for all the streams. And then I shared the struggles that we're still experiencing. So from everything, like, would you say we are ancestors of all the streams? I feel brave. I work with a lot of old, like, ex-teachers, and they taught me that, like, back in the day, they just, they could let silence just go for, like, ever. <laughs> silence makes me uncomfortable. Like, I'm like, I'd be, I'd be unmuting just to answer questions that have nothing to do with me, or, like, to throw in an input. I'm like, let me just reiterate what that person said, just in case you didn't hear, but I know you heard it, but I just want to say because I'm uncomfortable. Um, so, but yeah, I'm just going to let it rest. I'm going to take, I'm going to take note from them and just see. Yeah. Uh, while the stream would be getting to make these accomplishments and not having to go through the barriers to get there. Mm, I really like that. I, I, yes. Yes to that, to not having to go through the barriers. Because listen, I deserve ease. I deserve rest. I deserve softness. Um, anyone else? Okay, well, I'll, I'll tell y'all my tea. I'll tell y'all my synopsis. Um, so when I came up with this question, it was, it kind of came on because two summers ago, um, I had this like inner thought. I have a lot of inner thoughts. I 
think a lot. <laughs> um, I had this like moment where my great grandmothers were very instrumental to like just my identity and who I am. My mom told me all these wonderful stories about them. One of them died of a heartbreak. Um, real, real deal, real family tea, real story. It's really sad. Love her to pieces. She's one of the kindest people on the planet. Um, and yeah. And so I always heard about her and I, I literally as a kid, like these women were heroes to me. Like I'm, my identity is so like connected to them, I feel. Um, and I grew up in a matriarch, so I just love all the, all the women in my life. life. Um, but one of my great grandmothers was just all love and all these good things. And that's, my mom always tells me like, I feel like we inherited a lot of that. And then the other one, she never had access to education. She was abused like her entire life um, by the person she was married to, um, by the kids that she would raise, like everyone, because they saw her as less than, and the person she was with made that a thing, that she was a punching bag of everyone. And my mom and her were super close. And so when my mom was pregnant, she would like pray and talk to my mom's belly, which is me all the time. And she'd always kind of say like, she's gonna be my next coming. Like she's gonna do all the things I didn't get to do. She's gonna like, you know, be, be smart enough because you know, like people make her feel like she was stupid. Like all of these wonderful things. And so my whole life, because it was almost like something that I would hear all the time. I was always like, I'm gonna make them proud. Like everything I did was like, am I doing it? Is this what she wanted? Like I graduated, like, is this what she meant? Is this what she wanted? And I had this like epiphany moment where I was like, my great grandmothers who were sitting, my great grandmothers who were sitting in like Liberia in a rice farm who were experiencing violence, were not thinking about Western education. <laughs> like they were not thinking about Western accomplishments because they didn't exist in, you know, Eurocentrism. They didn't exist in Western ideals yet. That wasn't for them. That's not, and I was like, I don't think that's fully what they meant by, you know, wanting me to be everything that they weren't able to. I think that's a part of it. I think my happiness, my joy, my success in the place that I'm in is definitely a part of it. But I think it's also like to truly genuinely like reach a point where you're fully liberated. And when you're fully liberated, you don't forget to ensure that others can experience that, that you can pull them up, that you can hold on to them. Like my grandmother who was loving people to literally the end and always making sure everybody was good you don't fully get to, you know, like you don't get there if, if, if you don't think in that way. And so I had that realization that when people say we are ancestors of all the streams, I feel like oftentimes it now has kind of been commodified and it's always centered around like some type of like accomplishment within, you know, Western standards. And I'm like, no, I think it's for us to think bigger and broader because our ancestors were not thinking about these college degrees and these GPAs and, you know, that's not what they're thinking about. They're thinking about full blown radical liberation. And I feel like to your point, it's getting the things that I'm talking about with being liberated, right? Like not having to be like, oh my God, like, huh, I did all of this and now I finally got a crumb. It's just literally experiencing life and being, and, and being in joy and then supporting others as well. So to that, to my answer for this would be, I don't think we're fully there. I think we shouldn't limit what we think our ancestors' dreams are because I think their dreams were so big and so bold. And I think we have to be just as big and bold when we dream. So yeah. Thank you. Um, my email's here. My Facebook and LinkedIn's here. My Instagram's here. My Twitter's not because mind the business. Um, but if anybody has any questions, I will take them until they got to take them out. <laughs> Did you help your siblings along through the process? Yeah. Oh, I'm I'm so big on it. Like my my second sister who's 16 she's way cooler than me like I was very like I need to be perfect like oh my goodness I'm failing my sister's like it is what it is so she like we butt heads sometimes I'm like why don't you like why don't you want to take like three like extra college courses like you have the time and she's like dude I'm gonna sleep like, <laughs> like and I'm just like what? I'm like do you want me to help you like write that paper I can write that paper for you she's just like nah I'm just gonna turn it in I'm like edit it like you didn't add a comma like so I, I like in my heart I was like I was waiting for this I was like yes I'm gonna like make sure my sisters are perfect like they're great like they're so successful and my sister's like no it's not it's not I'm chilling and I love that for her too because I also think that's you know part of what I was saying like that's her she's not stressed in school so yeah any other questions thoughts comments Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I saw your soul being raised, though. Um, I was just wondering if you could explain like what you do now as um, 
um, like a policy person for education? Yeah, so I work at a um, early education like policy consulting firm. So pretty much we just go in, don't jump into consulting right after undergrad, by the way. It's, <laughs> it's, it's an amazing experience. I'm so honored. I'm sure when I'm like 40, I'm like, wow, I did that. But like right now at 20, I'm like, <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> but pretty much what we do is um, we just go around either being contracted or just supporting other work and ensure that like policies are implemented equitably. So like if, for instance, what I said about, um, you know, giving computers, like if, uh, if a, a, some, a state entity gives, you know, a group a certain amount of money, or if the government gives like a state X amount of money, um, and they're like, make sure it's like, like you distribute this money equitably and you make sure it's used in a way that's equitable. We come in and we're just like, okay, like what's your plan? Like, how are we gonna do this? Who are we talking to? Who are the community, the communities that are part of this? Like, how did you use this funds? Like, let's put together focus groups and talk to communities. How would they like to see it distributed? Like, we just make sure that everything is equitable. Like, if you're gonna give computers, does everybody have Wi-Fi? Does everybody have a place to, you know, study? So that's pretty much the rundown. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all so very much for just being present. Um, two, one more, and I'm done. <laughs> oh, we guys are having a great time too. You guys are free to feel free to go out the hallway, you can go to another workshop if you haven't completed that, or I highly suggest checking out.